Hey everybody, welcome to Maker Fun powered by Brilliant Labs. I'm so glad you could be here today. Today we're going to clean up oil spills, learn to draw and paint seashells, and make our very own stained glass jellyfish. For our oil spill activity, you'll need some water in a pan or a dish, hopefully a clean one, and you'll need some oil, and you'll need some absorbent materials like cotton balls or a rag or a pair of socks with holes in them that you don't mind cutting up. You'll also need some food coloring and whatever you might find useful to clean up the oil, such as um, a stick or a straw, maybe uh, Q-tips or dryer lint, paper towels, pipe cleaners, Kleenex, something like that. Go get some supplies and I'll meet you back here. Welcome friends to another Maker Fun activity. I'm Sarah and this is Lennon. Hi everybody! We're really excited because we're going to be looking at ocean science today. In particular, pollution caused by oil spills. When birds land in oil, um, it can affect their feathers and they can't fly as well. Oh, that's really sad and that's one of the best things that birds can do is to be able to land and take off. Why are oil spills so bad for the environment, Lennon? Because of animals, humans, mm. and the environment. What happens? Animals die. Yes, animals can die. So it's really important that we act quickly if something happens. An oil spill is when liquid petroleum such as gas and plastics and other things that we use every day spill out of a vessel, a pipeline, or something else, usually into the ocean. And when it happens, it can be so bad for the ecosystem, including animals. What happens to the animals, Lennon? Sometimes they die. And that's very sad. So in order to help the animals as quickly as possible, we need to be able to contain the oil with a... Boom! Exactly. A boom is a floating device that helps stop the oil from spreading further and it floats on top of the water. What are some types of booms that you think they use in real life, Lennon? A boom that has buoys and hooks. A boom made out of plastic. Yes, because plastic and buoys float and it needs to rest on top of the water. So, in our first part of our and activity... Also, for the stuff that canoes are made out of. Ah, fiberglass. That's something else that floats. That's a really good idea. If you want to learn more about commercial booms, things that we use on the oceans to help in a big way, you can certainly take a look at some of the links we've provided. Lennon and I have went ahead and created a sample boom to test out with our experiment. Before this challenge, you're going to need a bowl or a pan preferably clear so that you can see everything that's going on. You're going to need a pitcher with water. About how much water did we put in there, Lennon? A cup. A cup, that's right. You don't oh, need more than a here. cup. Exactly. You're also going to need a few tablespoons of cooking oil, some food coloring. And if you don't have enough water, you can go and get some more from your tap. Yes, exactly. So we, it's okay if you don't measure correctly the first time. It all depends on how big your pan is. You're also going to need some sort of absorbent material. And this is where we talk about how when it comes time to clean animals who might be affected by an oil spill, we can use certain absorbents. We've decided to use cotton balls, but you can use other things too. Like cotton balls, socks, dryer lint, folded paper towel, whatever you have around. Just make Toilet paper? Yeah, toilet paper. Just make sure that you ask an adult for all of the things that you go to get to make sure that it's okay. And of course, I mentioned we will be cleaning our animals. Now, we don't have real animals to clean. We're going to use two feathers that are pretty much the same, but you can also use two pieces of Lego that are the same or break a popsicle stick in half. I like to use a piece of a sock if I can. Okay, well today we'll use the cotton balls. So, Lennon and I made a boom to use for the first part of the activity. So the boom, again, is a containing device to help stop the oil from spreading. We decided to use a plastic bag. How did we do it, Lennon? We got the handle of a plastic bag and we got another handle of another plastic bag and we taped it all together. That's right. 
doesn't have to be perfect. Now, plastic bags are usually found in houses, though they're becoming more and more rare because they're not great for the environment. But it is useful to have them to do science experiments. Yes. All right, now that we're ready to start our activity, Lennon is going to take our cup of water and pour it into our pan. This is going to be our pretend ocean where all of the activity is happening. Then we take a little bit of food coloring and drop a few drops in and then you mix, mix it up. It. When you mix it, the food coloring won't mix perfectly well with your cooking oil because one is oil and one is water based. So you'll get little droplets. Can you describe those, Lennon? Little droplets mm -hmm. that are black. Black or they kind of look black depending on the food coloring that you use. So before we pour it into one end of our pan, which we're not going to do yet, you want to make sure that you have your boom nice and ready because just like a real oil spill, they want to be able to get the boom in there to stop the oil from spreading as quick as possible. Lennon's about to pour in our oil spill. Oh no, look at it go. And then he puts our boom in. And that is supposed to stop the oil from spreading. And then quickly we add... Our, a feather in one end where there's no boom and the other end where there is a boom. So now that we've added our oil and our boom, we quickly put our feathers in, one in each side of our pan, one in the side where the oil is and one in the side where the oil stops spreading. And we wait about five seconds. Do you want to count? One, two, three, four, five. Good. We just want to make sure they're poked out. And then it's very important that we stop and we see that Lennon and I made a sign here to show which side ha you had a boom and which side did not have a boom. So the feather here is a side that it was in the most oil. And so it goes over here. And then the feather that had protection from the boom goes over here. Now we're able to be able to compare just how well the boom worked. So, Lennon, would you like to take your absorbent material and carefully clean? The one that was protected by the boom. Yes, that's right. Lennon's cleaning the feather that did not have the boom, and we're going to test it to see just which one worked better or which one had less oil on it. So, let's show the folks at home the difference. So, I can see that this one is puffier than this one, isn't it? Yeah, the puffier one is always the, the wetter one. I mean, the... Um, one. Exactly. So which one would that be? The one that's protected? <laughs> that would be the one that is protected by the boom. And then the feather that was in the area where there was no oil containment from the boom looks much more oily, doesn't it? Yeah. Now for the second part of our experiment, we are going to check to see just how well dish detergent helps to clean oil off of our oily feather, the feather that came from the area that did not have the protection from the boom. In real life, dish detergent and similar soaps are used to help clean off birds' feathers. So I'm going to give Lennon just a little drop of dish detergent on an absorbent material and he's going to rub just the one feather that's still oily and see if there's any difference. You're cleaning it with the soap, clean, clean, clean. Wow, I'm seeing a bit of a difference. And are you seeing, maybe take a look at the cleaning pad there and see if you can see any of that colored oil coming off. Open it up. Whoa, I see some, don't you? Good job. So, our oily feather that was not protected by the boom before is certainly getting a little bit clearer. Now, if we were to blow dry, do you want to blow dry a bit? One more. Oh, wow. I can already see that the dish detergent did what? Clean. Awesome. So, we just did an experiment with a few different materials from around the house, but if you wanted to try to make a boom out of other materials other than a plastic bag and tape, you can. And it'd be fun to test some more absorbent materials as well. Again, what can we use for absorbent materials other than cotton balls? Socks, toilet paper, Paper towel. Yeah, exactly. And also, uh, um, a bit of fabric. A bit of fabric. Hey, that's a really good idea. We didn't even think of that one yet. Well, friends, we had a really good time exploring ocean science and the effects of oil pollution, cleaning up with the boom as a containment, and then working to clean our animals with some dish detergent. We would love to hear what you did at home, so please share your photos with us either on our social media feeds or perhaps mail us a photo 
that you've taken of your science experiment. And we hope to see you next time. Remember, stay brilliant. Catch you soon. <laughs>
our kind of window pane for our stained glass. And now I'm just going to take tissue paper and rip it into strips. And my thought is that I'll tape down the edges and, and it's totally cool with things like overlap. So, and you can do this all in one color. Um, I'm choosing to do three different colors because that's what I found in my craft drawer. There, so I think all the little pockets that I've cut out are all covered. Now I'm going to use some tape. and tape down the edges and anywhere that I think the tissue is lifting. And it's okay if we're taping through the middle because this is clear tape so we know that um, it will allow light to shine through. And I think what I'll do is I will trim up all these edges that are hanging over the side. Hmm, oh, I better tape down over here. to see what it looks like and I turn it over. And if you create one at home, we would love to see what yours looks like. You can send it in to any of our social media. Um, all right, ready for this grand reveal? Wow! And there you have it. You have a beautiful stained glass artwork of a sea creature.
Hi everyone, Gracie here again. Whether I'm at home hanging out with friends or at school, I always love to get creative. One way I enjoy expressing myself is to paint with watercolors. Ever since I was really young, I have loved to paint. In fact, some of my early artwork was bought as a part of a fundraiser and now is in New York City. It's obvious that a lot of others in the Brilliant Labs community enjoy painting too. In fact, next up is Natalie. She is going to share with us how she was inspired to use watercolors to paint some marine life. Sometimes though, we don't have some paints on hand, so to help inspire you, I wanted to share some tips and tricks on how to make your own watercolor paints. Sometimes you have markers that don't work anymore, but there is still color inside. Have your parents remove the end of your old markers and pull out the felt. Cut the felt into small pieces and soak them in a bit of water. We use these little cups from restaurant milk creamers because they aren't recyclable, so we like to reuse them for crafts. No! <laughs> They're so hot! <laughs> Once your colors have soaked, you can use a brush to add them to a paper or a canvas. Also, you can use a piece of glass or a plate to mark on with good markers. Then, you use a brush, you dip it in a tiny bit of water, and you mix the colors like that. Put it on here. And then there's this. Whoa. I hope this helps you if you can't find watercolors. Here's a list of materials that you will need to follow along with Nelly as she paints. Watercolor paints, paint brushes, paper, and pens. Thanks everyone for joining me. Now on to Nelly for some inspirational marine painting. <laughs> Oysters have been cultivated by humans for over 4,000 years. They are eaten as a delicacy all over the world and are known for their pearls, which grow gradually like a callus around irritating bits that get into their shell. Oysters live in groups called beds on the ocean floor, and they never stop growing. Their shell grows new layers as they get older, which are bumpy and irregular, making them a great beginner shell to draw. Just start with a tiny drop and keep adding new wiggly layers until it looks like it's all grown. Mussels are as easy to draw as oysters because they too just add new layers as they grow. Mussels grow in groups and they attach themselves to rocks and each other with incredibly strong strings that they make out of their own body. There are lots of types of mussels from around the world, and unfortunately, they find it quite easy to tag along on human ships to new habitats, invade, and take over the local ecosystem from native animals. Animals and plants that do that are called invasive species, and a local invasive species you may have heard of is called a zebra mussel. A nautilus is one of my favorite mollusks. According to the fossil record, they have been around mostly unchanged for over 200 million years. They look a bit like a squid living in a seashell, and they keep the front door on their head. Nautiluses form shells with internal chambers that are nearly mathematically perfect and pearly on the inside. The word nautilus comes from an early word for sailor, and there's a deep ocean exploring robot named Nautilus. Scallops are related to clams, but they're usually symmetrical, and their shell is one of the most recognizable shapes. Their numbers are declining rapidly due to overfishing, climate effects, pollutants, and believe it or not, shark hunting. Sharks usually keep the ray population down, and rays are one of the scallops' main predators. Generally, eating scallops is not very sustainable, unless they're caught by divers who pick them up individually, instead of ships which scrape the sea floor for them and disturb a lot of ecosystems. If you have any of these shells in your collection, take a picture and send them to us. You can find us through brilliantlabs.ca. Echinoderms include sea stars, sand dollars, 
sea urchins, brittle stars, and sea cucumbers. They're all radially symmetrical, but they can have five, six, or even up to 50 arms. Sea urchins can sting with poison kept in their spines. Sea stars can regrow an arm that has been bitten or chopped off, and brittle stars like to curl up around corals and sponges in the deep ocean. Thanks everyone for joining us today. We cleaned up oil spills, we learned about jellyfish, and lots of sea creatures. I'm really looking forward to seeing you next time. Can you share with us stuff you made this week? Please get in touch with us on our social media or our Brilliant Labs website, brilliantlabs.ca. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. Get in touch, we'd love to see what you've done. I'd like to thank everyone who helps make Maker Fun happen, and thanks to you for joining in. We'll see you next time. Stay brilliant.